Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good, how about you? I am well, thank you. Okay, let's share this here. And then I'm, I think I'm ready to go. All right. We got Riley here in class this morning, that's it. One person. <laughs> One person here in Twin. But like four in Burley, that's nice, that'll work. Okay. All right. Um, just, I and I have not heard anything from the, well, that's not entirely true. Okay, so the Blaine County Center is closed currently due to COVID, right? And it, had, it was, I think, all last week. And I think we've got another week to go while it's closed. So there's nobody there at the moment anybody who wanted to be but as far as i know nobody in our class has covid up there i haven't heard anything from burley if there's covid over there so hopefully if anybody has an issue in class that you you know hopefully you'll let me know however we've got a third case here in twin so um that person will not be showing up and that person was not here on friday so with that in mind i think that we're okay I think everybody's okay. If you feel uncomfortable, um, you could always just get on Zoom if that, if you feel more comfortable doing that. So that can work uh, if you'd rather do it that way. Okay. Um, we are on week seven. Hopefully you did your uh, the discussion. I'll grade that uh, after class today for the global philosophers. This week, we're, we're gonna be talking about the shrinking of Afro-Eurasian world. And we've got a couple of different things that we're gonna go through this morning and then obviously again on Wednesday uh, that we'll talk about. And then Friday, we'll do a primary source analysis, talk about uh, some things there. Um, I wanna give you kind of a, an idea of what's going on. And then we're gonna talk about this, the shrinking of the Afro-Eurasian world uh, about the Silk Road. So we'll talk about those two things today. If we have time, there's like a, I've got a five minute Vox video that um, I wouldn't mind sharing, but if I don't, if I don't have time, then we won't get to that. And I'll post a link on Canvas so that you all can see that. Uh, a kind of more a, a contemporary uh, thought about the Silk Road and uh, kind of what we're, that significance piece, right? Okay, so next week, we are week seven. Next week is midterms. Okay, so next week is week eight, and we will be uh, we will not be here on Monday. Okay, so just so you all know, Monday is a holiday. We will not be here. I will not be here. Uh, you can definitely show up, I suppose, but I don't think anybody will be on campus. So uh, I wouldn't if I were you. With that being said. I generally give you Friday to do the exam. However, because Monday is a holiday, we'll do review on Wednesday. If you want to be here Wednesday and everybody comes on Wednesday and does the review, then uh, we, we don't need to necessarily do class on Friday. However, I think that's not gonna be the case. I think the best way to probably do it is to review on Wednesday. And then if you wanna do the exam, then do the exam and don't show up Friday. If you wanna show back up on Friday for those people who didn't come on Wednesday or whatever, we'll, I'll be here Friday morning and do review and then you can do the exam, okay? Either way, the exam will be open uh, Wednesday and it'll run through Monday. And the only reason it's gonna be, it's gonna run through Monday is that I've had a couple of people already tell me that they'll be out of town uh, next, not this upcoming weekend, but the following weekend. And so I'm going to have to extend that. Okay, so it'll be extended right off the bat, extended through Monday night, Monday at midnight. Okay, again, uh, same rules apply. And we'll talk more about this. But uh, if you need more time on an exam, 
get with me earlier, send an email, whatever. It's easier for me to extend the exam than to have it close. And then I've got to go back and do something different. And that um, it's just easier if you'll email me Monday night and we'll talk about this next week. But I just want to make sure that you all know uh, about the exam, know that that's what I need done. So next week, so this week, Monday, Wednesday will be the exact same, exact same lecture. Uh, Friday, we'll do something different. We'll do primary source analysis. And then uh, next week, no, no school on Monday. And then uh, review for the exam Wednesday, Friday. You can take the exam anytime after Wednesday. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Perfect. So let's get in. I'm going to open the book. I don't know if you've all noticed, but I went and put the Zoom link here in case you needed it. It's underneath each module. And I think I talked about that last week, but the Zoom link is here in case you might need it. Okay. I'm going to open up and I'm Probably should have done that with the book, but. I just want to get a map here. And I think it's, yeah. So we're gonna talk about the Hellenistic world today. Um, I think it's important to, to talk about the Hellenistic world and then we're gonna get into the Silk Road. Uh, first, for three centuries, uh, Greek culture spread from its homeland to as far away as Asia. Okay, and so you're getting you're getting Greek culture, which is kind of traveling out this direction and heading almost out uh, to north of India. Okay, into Asia, but not East Asia. Uh, these are from Macedonian conquest. They're taking off from there. The Macedonians were Greeks. Um, but they were seen as backward, semi-barbaric, the Macedonians were. They didn't have any government. They did have a king. Uh, they came from the same stock as Greeks and were ruled by an aristocracy. Okay. Philip II was the head of the Macedonian army. And at 23 years old, um, he starts pushing east. Okay. He's the father of Alexander the Great. He's an amazing general in his own right. And honestly, if you, if you study this time period, Philip II is a great, uh, is a great leader, a great general, which is why I think that Alexander the Great becomes so great himself, right? Uh, Philip used bribery and warfare and threats to subdue these different kingdoms as he moves east, okay? He's, uh, he spent three years as a hostage in Thebes, and he was watching their tactics. So the entire time, as he's a prisoner for three years, he's watching what they're doing. And so when he goes back, he's able to use those exact same tactics to then move across East Asia, or not East Asia, into Asia, moving east from Greece, okay? Um, he, two main concerns. He wants to safeguard the border now, this is, this is something that we're going to continually see, is this idea of uh, safeguarding the border. We've talked a little bit about it, especially when we're talking about uh, Rome or other, other places. That's why in the Pacific, we don't really have the same issue, is because you've got an already made border in the water, right in the ocean. He's trying to safeguard the border. He also is reorganizing his army, and he or reorganizes the army this way. He has a corps of engineers who are going to work on weaponry, towers, catapults. He then gives them uniforms. Okay, so he provides his military with uniforms. He has them take a loyalty oath. This loyalty oath is to the king, not to city states. Prior, right, we've already talked about this, that militaries were uh, they were more like militias of your, your city state militia. He's gathering all of these people and he's making them loyal to the king. We're starting to see, right, these larger militaries that are coming out of this. And this is a piece of what we talked about last week. Okay. And then I would suggest that the, the largest piece 
is that he starts using double-edged swords. Okay, now I'm not a military historian, that is not my thing. But I think that the double-edged sword is, a, is an important piece that Philip starts using, which makes his army uh, more effective, okay? So Philip brings in philosophers. He thought that this would bring, um, that this would help the neighboring communities that he's overtaking to understand their culture better, okay? The historian Plutarch uh, in his life wrote just after Philip had taken uh, Potidia, he received three messages at one time. And that through a great battle, there became there was a horse race and that horse race won uh, is what gives rise to the Olympic games, okay? And anyway, the idea is, is that the Olympic games comes out of these warring factions that are going on and that now you're seeing these people compete in war and they're like, hey, what if we competed in these games, okay? This ends democracy in Greece as Alexander the Great comes of age and takes over, okay? Let's talk about, there are four pieces of Hellenistic culture that I want to talk about, and then we're going to, we're going to talk about why those are significant and into what the next piece is and why that's significant. So literature, in Hellenistic culture, literature is an, in, a, a major piece of history, okay? First, it provided history, right? We start to get historians, Plutarch happens to be one of those, um, there's a lot of, a lot of bad things said about Plutarch actually, uh, from historians. One of those happens to be that he wasn't accurate. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's accurate or not. I've seen set or read several different things about his accuracy. One of the things that Plutarch talks about are these large ants. I don't know if any of, if any of you have read this, but he talks about these large ants and for a long time that were covered in gold and for a long time people were like you see this is the, he's a, he's a liar there's no such thing as these large dog-sized ants okay but then here about 10 15 years ago we found that there were in this roughly the same area there were marmots that would dig dig into hillsides and then uh basically like cover themselves in gold when they would find gold, they would cover themselves with gold. They would look like these uh, marmots with gold on them. And, and they looked they look like large ants, right? So if you didn't have a word for that, maybe, maybe you would think that. So anyway, just a thought. Hellenistic culture though, the literature piece of that history, it provided a chronology. Uh, we know this from recent historians citing their works that Hellenistic culture brought in that history and that chronology, okay? It gives us a way to be able to look at the past, okay? Uh, they start writing, writing stories, right? We start to get uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey out of this time, okay? Hellenistic culture also brought philosophy. You have Epicureans and Stoics. Epicureans are uh, wealthy, they're about the party. It's about a show. Stoics are uh, not giving in to self gratification, self pleasure. Okay. So, literature, philosophy, religion is the next one. Religion is interesting and uh, in, in the last book that we used to use, I had actual points here that we, that we would get to, but we don't, we don't really talk about this in this chapter. So religion though helps bring math, science, and then a heliocentric theory. Okay, so we're starting to see that religion is starting to take on um, a much broader idea. It's not about you necessarily dealing with a God in a polytheistic 
way, but it's actually starting to look at math, science, okay? Now this is gonna ebb and flow, as you all know. I mean, I don't need to say a lot about that, but we start to get this, uh, this look at math and science. It's gonna, that'll uh, decrease later on and then we'll see it increase again, okay? And the last, the last point here is art. There was more money for architecture and sculptures, large urban centers. Art at this point is showing uh, sentimentality, emotion, and it was realistic, okay? Um, I do wanna make a, a, a point here though, and hopefully this isn't gonna come as a shock to everybody, uh, but the art, the art that we're seeing at this point in time and the art that we're seeing throughout uh, Greece and Rome is very colorful, okay? The statues that we often see from this time period are white, right? Like very white. And part of the problem is, is that when we found those, the coloring had, um, had faded so bad that it was easier to take the color off than to, to, to actually color them. At that point, we didn't really know how to color them effectively either um, and preserve it. So, so a lot of the statues, a lot of the artwork that we see is this like stark white color, right? That's not the way that it would have been. If you've seen mosaics uh, during the time period, during the reign of Justinian, uh, which is later, but Etruscan art, Hellenistic art, we see all of these things as being this stark white, but they weren't stark white. And there's multiple articles that you could read um, in, in classes, two, uh, three and 400 level classes that I teach, we read some of those pieces. But uh, that is a Renaissance thing, okay? So during the Renaissance, as they're finding some of these statues, they're saying that uh, Hellenistic art was one of the highest forms and it was white, but it wasn't actually white, it was actually colored. Okay, so there's a lot of the statues that we see that people are trying to recreate now so that you can see how they would have, the coloring that they would have been, which is fascinating to me. But uh, I just think that it's interesting that we've decided that what the, the highest form of art is this like stark white, uh, marble, right? And so you, you don't see that coloring, but I, they were actually, all of them colored. I mean, it, uh, ornately colored. I'm trying to think of um, the, the uh, statue, the, the one famous statue of Caesar, uh, and I, I could probably pull it up, but it's, it's white. It's, the, it's the, the statue that we all know of Caesar uh, with his breastplate on, and he's, he's standing there. Anyway, and it's, it's white, but we can see the coloring on it and there are emblems on his, uh, on his breastplate, his, the, uh, the, the, uh, I, the whole thing is colored. His hair is colored, his face is colored. And then the bottom of his uh, like loincloth area is all colored as well. So that it shows like the red coloring with the gold Anyway, I think it's fascinating. I just think that you all should know that, that as we move forward and you see these, these statues that are stark white, they actually weren't white at the time. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, that's kind of the idea of the Hellenistic world. Why that is important is because we're going to get, we're going to see that this is going to spread around the world. There we go. Through the formation of the Silk Road, okay? Now, the Silk Road or Silk Roads are, happen over time. So we're talking about the formation of the Silk Road but today we're going to talk 
more broadly about the Silk Road or in Silk Roads in general, okay, across time, not necessarily just today or just the, the time period that we're talking about. We're not talking about just three, 300 BCE, right? We're, we're talking across time. This is what it's gonna start to look like. So in the beginning, what we get is a road that kind of comes out of uh, Antolia and over into uh, what would be Pakistan kind of, it, it kind of comes down into here. And then a second road that takes off into the, uh, the Han Dynasty, okay? So into this area. And it kind of runs like down one and then over. And that's the, there are two roads at the time and it drops in here and then out. And then over time, you start to get all of these different roads. Not only are they overland roads, but across the ocean as well, okay? Which makes sense, especially since we've been talking about this semester so far, all of the trade that's happening along rivers and the ocean, right? So you would obviously, we'd obviously see that this is the way that it's, it's going, that you're gonna get these roads that happen throughout the ocean and into waterways, okay? This, the Silk Roads brought culture and goods from the Aegean Sea or the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf, clear to the Pacific Ocean, okay, into East Asia. Also using uh, sea routes, they were intricate systems. Intricate systems, intricate network of roads that connected people and cultures, okay. This is gonna be your discussion question this week, we'll be on the Silk Roads. Um, Chinese goods coming to Rome were obviously silk, which is why they called it the Silk Roads. But we've got to understand that there's a lot of things going on here. It's not just uh, silk that's going back and forth. In fact, not only out of, it's not just silk coming out of China, it's also jade, silver, and iron that is leaving China and going to other places, okay? Uh, Silk actually started a huge, a huge problem in Rome. Uh, there were several people who thought that silk was not structured enough. And so when women wore silk that you could see everything. And so they were saying, look, we should, you're not wearing any clothes, so you should not be wearing silk. However, wealthy people really liked silk. And so it continued, even though they tried to ban silk multiple times, uh, in the Roman Empire, they couldn't they couldn't ban it because obviously wealthy people, just like in our day, have more of a say than uh, other people. Uh, so all attempts to ban silk failed due to the wealthy. Okay, out of India we get cotton. Cotton is coming out of India. Out of Africa, especially East Africa, we're getting ivory. Uh, out of Arabia, you're getting incense and spices. And then Roman goods are glassware, olives, olive oil, and wine. I know that that is very stereotypical, but that is what's coming out of uh, the Roman, out of Rome, okay? So with that though, I also wanna talk about that we're also get, seeing uh, military implements that are coming out of this. Two major implements coming out of China. First, the crossbow. The crossbow comes out of China and it makes its way across the Silk Roads and is being sold. Part of that is, is that as people make their way to China, they're seeing people with crossbows and are like, hey, I want one of those. That looks awesome. I need one of those, okay? So we get really the uh, crossbows that are moved across to the West. The second piece of this coming out of China is gunpowder. Now, obviously we're not using guns at this point in time, but gunpowder can be used for a lot of different uses. China is, the Chinese are using it uh, for military purposes as well. And so it starts to make its way across to the West, okay? One of the important pieces that I, I, may, I may want you to talk about in an exam, I mean, I, you can talk about it if you want. I don't necessarily uh, expect you to, to use it, but that 
these, there are pastoral communities, right? We talked about these nomadic pastoral communities that are kind of living out in the desert and along the, the edges. And they start, they are used very successfully as people who could trade from place to place, okay? So as we can see, these nomadic lifestyles made it easier for people to trade across those things. There are a couple of different reasons. One, they live in these places that can be difficult to get across. And they're already nomadic or pastoral. And so they have the way, the means to be able to, to move back and forth across these areas. But two, they have the relationships with people in these areas. One of those happens to be the Mongols. The Mongols uh, end up being a protective force around the uh, Silk Roads. The Mongols help because these pastoral people have a relationship with them. And so they become guards at different times uh, for people on the Silk Road. Okay. It also, these nomadic or pastoral people uh, were used to the diseases along these trade routes because they lived in these places. And so it was easier for them to pack up, take goods and uh, goods to another area, drop those off, and then the next pastoral uh, group would then pick those goods up and take them to the next place. Each one of them was adding a little bit of money so that they could make money off of the trading of these goods as they did it across this area, right? If we're talking the ocean, that's not happening. You're getting goods that are coming down using pastoral people, and then they're putting them on a ship, and then they're moving across the ocean or a waterway. Okay. Uh, small towns began to sprung up, uh, be, began to establish, I should say, uh, in these different areas, right? So that's the way that we get these towns that are happening. You can't, just like today, you would need a place to stop, right? You need a place to stop along the, the way and be able to get more resources or be able to fill up water or canteens or whatever, you would need those things, a place to sleep at night. And so as those things happened, you would get these spots that sprung up along here. We, we have the exact same thing that happens in the West, right? You have these towns that spring up due to uh, the Oregon Trail. The Kelton Road comes right through here. And so we have several of those different places that happen. Twin Falls happens to be one of those, right? Mountain Home happens to be one of those. Rattlesnake Station was right up above Mountain Home, and that's how Mountain Home got its start, is from a, uh, a stage stop along the Kelton Road. Okay, this is not abnormal. This is actually very normal to see these places as you need a spot that people would say, you know, it'd be really great if we had somewhere to eat here. And so all of a sudden you'd get something. The, it didn't always start this way, but monasteries was a good way to get things started. You would start a monastery, you'd be out in the middle of nowhere. So if you were trying to not have pleasure in your life, right? If you're trying to be one of those people, then you would go out and live in the middle of nowhere. And then as people came through on the Silk Road, you would provide food and water and whatever for them. And this was also good for these pastoral people who were going from place to place and trading these things, because as they would come in, they'd have a place to eat. But then they'd also pray with these monks that were out there in these monasteries and the monks could then pray for their continued success. Okay. It was, it was good for both a win-win if you will. So you get these different towns coming across all the way to the Han empire. Okay. And that's, this is the way that uh, these silk roads kind of took shape over time. The roads continued even after the fall of the Roman Empire and through multiple Chinese dynasties. The roads didn't, didn't dry up. These were used forever. I, I, got, I must stress, I probably should have stressed this before. These are not actual roads, right? These are just overland routes. So you're not, if you were to go uh, to Asia or Europe today, you're not gonna find like a, a silk road. It's, these were just paths that people were taking, okay? There are three significant points that I wanna talk about 
that this helped with. First is the economic impact. Now, obviously, the economic impact impact is silk, right? Silk is the number one thing. You're getting silk going back and forth, but there also is an economic impact when we're talking about uh, other people working. So this puts to work people who are working in the silk industry, but also people who are transporting silk back and forth. They're making money. So the economic impact is huge, but it's not just silk, right? We're putting other people to work as well. And this is something that we need to understand, okay? Well, I was living in Boise, my wife and I would often, often say, you know, hey, we, we just like to buy local. Right, we wanna make sure that we're helping local businesses, we don't shop at big box stores, things like that, okay? Super pretentious, trust me, I'm, I'm probably the most pretentious person you'll meet. But as I was talking to somebody one day, they were like, well, what about those people who work at McDonald's? They work here and that money is here. And I got to thinking about that, that that is true, right? The people who are working at the big box, people here in Twin Falls who are working at Target live here and that money is being spent here now it's not the same amount of money as a mom and pop shop right that money i think the the uh, statistic is 75 percent of that money of a mom and pop shop stays local whereas only 40 percent of target's money is going to stay local as it's just the people who are getting paid and then some a little extra money the target puts into the community but regardless that's what's going on and the silk road is exactly the same those people who are working along the Silk Road are having that uh, economic impact, right? It provides jobs, it provides uh, money. It's putting people to work and being able to help them sustain life, okay? The economic impact is not just the goods that are being sold across the Silk Road, it's actually employing all the people on these black dots all the way across. You see what I'm saying? That's, that is a major impact when you're saying that your life is being able to be sustained because of the trade on the Silk Road. Okay. So the economic impact, super important when we're talking about the Silk Road. And it's not just those people in the silk industry, <coughs> sorry, or uh, in the wine olives, olive oil industry. It's all of these people that are also being impacted uh, secondarily, okay? Next is ideas. Ideas were moved throughout this region, throughout the Silk Road. Ideas are, major, are a major idea, are a major point because what it does is that it allows for different ideas to go back and forth. And I can give you the example, the major example is religion. Religion ebbs and flows across the Silk Road. I keep using my hands up here, but you all can't see that, I'm sorry. So across this region, right? So as we start to see Christianity moves this way, Buddhism moves this way, right? We talked about last week that Buddhism comes out of India, but it makes its way on the Silk Road to China where it becomes a major religion, a major philosophy, right? Islam spreads this way. Islam spreads out of the Arabian desert and then and takes off across the east. Ideas change and we start to see as, as Christianity, as Christians and Muslims start to battle, that spread happened across the Silk Road. Okay. Now it's not just religion or philosophy that's changing. You get a lot of different ideas, military ideas you get as different uh, militaries fought one another. Okay. You start to see that as well. Lastly is disease. Okay. So economic impact, ideas, disease is the third one. Disease is important as we can tell today, right? We start to see disease going back and forth. Before, when people were not, uh, when they were not trading this far, you had the, 
you would have these sicknesses that you would become immune to as you lived in these areas. But as you start to mingle with other people, you're getting diseases that you're not used to. And so we start to see smallpox, which is a major issue, but the biggest issue is the plague. And we see the plague run across into Europe, out of China at 534. This is CE, right, or AD. 534, 750, and then our, obviously the largest one in 1346, which kills half of Europe. Now, we all should understand this today, right? Because as we're seeing in the exact same way, COVID comes out of China, moves to the, moves to the east and west rather, but it's this idea of global trade net networks, okay? So economic impact, ideas, disease. Those are the three significant points that you would want to talk about on the discussion this week, but also uh, in the exam next week, okay? Now, let me give you one point of interest, and then I think we'll have time to watch this five-minute video. Uh, comes down to globalization. Now, I realize that we live in a fairly, not fairly, in a very conservative area. And I continually get told about that our world is so globalized and we need to only take care of ourselves. And look, I got that. I'm not arguing against that at all. What I am arguing is that globalization is not a new thing. Globalization has been happening for a long time. And I would suggest that the Silk Roads are one way that we can see that globalization. This is not new. It's not new, okay? Globalization brought a lot of great products and prosperity. It also brought threats, which I understand in this area, right, that that's the major issue, is that globalization is also going to bring threats, and that's different ideas, different people, diseases. I mean, there's, I get it. I'm not, I'm not saying either way, I'm just saying that globalization has been going on for a lot longer than what we would like to think, okay? Globalization has been happening for a long time. We've been connected. In fact, Jared Diamond, uh, in his, I think it's Collapse, it might be Guns, Germs, and Steel, but I think it's Collapse where he talks about that uh, globalization has been going on since uh, before the birth of Christ. And that that is probably true. We're probably getting, uh, there is uh, sources of people coming across, and I can't really show it here, but coming across the North Sea, around the Atlantic, and then down the coast, trading in the Americas for a long time, okay? So if that's the case, there's been a lot of Globalization. Globalization has been happening for a lot longer than we like to anticipate. Okay. So let me do this. Can everybody hear that? Yaslin, can you hear it? I can hear a little bit. Okay. I want to, I'm going to play this video. Can you guys hear it in Burley? Yeah, okay. I wanna play this video. This is from Vox, uh, but this is going to give you an idea of exactly what we're talking about with the Silk Road and a contemporary idea of the Silk Road today, okay? I'm wearing a jacket sleeve. And a new rail terminal in Kazakhstan. The seaport in Sri Lanka recently opened, as well as this bridge in rural Laos. What's interesting is that they're all part of one country project that spans three continents and touches over 60% of the world's population. If you connect the dots, it's not hard to see which country they're in. This is China's Belt and Road Initiative. The most ambitious infrastructure project in modern history was designed to reroute global trade. And it's how China plans to become the world's next superpower. It's 
2013, and Chinese President Xi Jinping is giving a speech in Kazakhstan, where he mentions the nation's silk road. The network of trade routes that spread goods, ideas, and culture across Europe, the Middle East, and China as far back as 200 BC. Dan says, We should take a little bit step forward. Oh, yes, you did. And shortly build an economic belt along the Silk Road. Christian, you can. A month later, Xi is in Indonesia. Then two sides should work together to build up a new maritime road in the 21st century. These two phrases were the first mentions of Xi's legacy project, the multi-trillion dollar Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. They're also the two components of the plan. There's an overland economic belt with six corridors that serve as new routes to get goods in and out of China, like this railroad connecting China to London, and these gas pipelines from the Caspian Sea to China, and a high-speed train network in Southeast Asia. Then there's the Maritime Silk Road a chain of seaports stretching from the South China Sea to Africa that also directs trade to and from China. The BRI also includes oil refineries, industrial parks, power plants, mines, and fiber optic networks, all designed to make it easier for the world to trade with China. So far, over 60 countries have reportedly signed agreements with these projects, and the list is growing because China promotes it as a win-win for everyone. Take, for example, the BRI's flagship project, Pakistan. Like many countries in Central and South Asia, Pakistan has a stagnant economy and a corruption problem. It wasn't a popular place for foreign investment, that is until China came along. In 2001, China offered to build a brand new port in the small fishing town of Gwadar. By 2018, the port, as well as a highway and railway networks, became a $62 billion corridor within the BRI, where the economic belt meets the maritime Silk Road, and it seemed to benefit both countries. Pakistan saw its highest GDP growth in eight years and forged a tight relationship with a major world power. China, on the other hand, secured a new alternative route for goods, especially oil and gas from the Middle East. Through projects like these, it also found a way to boost its economy. Chinese construction companies that had fewer opportunities within their own country saw a huge boost from BRI contracting. Seven out of the 10 biggest construction firms in the world are now Chinese. What tips the balance in China's favor even more is the requirement that it be involved in building these projects. In Pakistan, for example, Chinese workers have directly built projects like this highway here, and a Chinese firm has worked with locals on a railway here in Serbia. China's involvement is one of its very few demands, and that's simply scaled apart so far. See, typically, to get investment from the West, countries have to meet strict ethical standards. But China's offered billions of dollars, mostly in loans, with far fewer conditions. So it's no surprise the BRI has been a big hit with the less democratic countries in the region. China has signed agreements with authoritarian governments, military regimes, and some of the most corrupt countries in the world. It's even affiliated with Afghanistan, Ukraine, Yemen, and Iraq, all currently supported by conflict. Because of China's willingness to loan money to unreliable companies, many experts have called the BRI a waste of money. Eventually, these countries will have to pay China back Corruption and conflict make their payback unlikely. A recent report found that many of the countries indebted to China are very vulnerable, including eight that are at high risk of being unable to pay. So why does China keep money? Because there's more to the BRI than just economics. In Sri Lanka, China loaned about $1.5 billion to a Manitou water port. It was a key stop in the American Silk Road. By 2017, it was clear Sri Lanka couldn't pay back the loan. So instead, they gave China control of the port as part of the 99 deal. China also controls the strategic port in Pakistan, where it has a coal mine base. It's pushing for a similar agreement in Myanmar, and it just opened an actual Chinese naval base in Djibouti. These are all signs of what's been called the String of Pearls theory. It predicts that China is trying to establish a string of naval bases in the Indian Ocean that will allow it to station ships and guard shipping routes that move through the region. So while China's not getting its money back, it's still achieving some very important strategic goals. China's growing influence challenges the status of the U.S., which has been the world's lone superpower for the last several decades. But isolation is trending in the U.S., meaning that they are investing less and therefore losing influence around the world. The BRI is China's way of leveraging power to become a global leader. By building relationships and taking control of global trade, China's well on its way. All right, so although 
although interesting in a modern day sense, what's fascinating about this is that it uses the exact same things, right? We can see that the military, right? They made the last point here that the military, they're setting up these bases or that's kind of the idea. Uh, so ideas are moving that way. Economic impact, you saw the amount of money that's going into this and it's helping not only those countries, but China. Uh, and then that uh, Xi Jinping also decided that he was going to follow the Silk Road, that the, the uh, ancient Silk Road to be able to set up these uh, trade routes, right? And so now they're doing all of these things. I find it fascinating because as, I as I'm working through, uh, through the Silk Road, I come across this video that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what's going on. Like we're seeing it in real time, these things going on today and how important they still are, right? Setting up these trade routes, being able to take different ideas. Ultimately though, it's about creating prosperity and power for one country. And back, back when we're talking about the Silk Road, the ancient Silk Road, it was about building up Rome and the Han Dynasty. Although Rome fell and the Han Dynasty fell itself and you have multiple other dynasties and other empires going on, it creates power for both. Okay, and here we are in the 21st century, seeing the Silk Roads being not only talked about, but used in the exact same way. Money, power, ideas, and as we're sitting here today, disease, right? These things continue to happen. Now, the worst thing that you can tell a historian is that we have to study history so that we don't repeat it. Look, we're, we're gonna repeat it. That's the way it works. These things continue to happen. It's whether we learn from it or not. Can we, can we change something and, not, and make sure that it doesn't happen? In my mind, here we are using the Silk Roads for the exact thing that we were using it before. Is there a way that we can make it better? Or is there a way that we can use it to our benefit, right? Anyway, here we are. I hope that that made sense to you all. I'll stop sharing here. Um, so Wednesday, we'll talk about, I'll do all of this again. We'll hopefully watch that video. If you don't wanna come, you don't need to be here. Uh, Friday, we'll do the uh, primary source analysis. Uh, we may talk about the Silk Road some more, but I doubt it. I feel like that I've, I've covered it enough. If you have questions or concerns, please reach out to me, uh, email, call, stop by my office, catch me after class, whatever you need to do. Uh, I hope you have a great week. I will chat with you Wednesday. We'll see you later. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah, thank you all. Bye.